Hey, welcome to Calgary Basement Sessions. I'm Ben Price. And I'm Ben Montgomery. And today we're talking to James Rexiedler. Uh, James plays in a band called Rayho, and Rayho is a rock act formed in 2011, blending nostalgic 80s, edgy ambient rock guitar tones with thoughtful, reflective, and socially conscious lyrics to create a wholly modern rock voice. Rayho's first album, When the World Starts Again, was released in 2011. Their follow-up, The Successful Tomorrowland, released in 2015, and they're currently slated to release their third major studio album in the upcoming months of string spring. <laughs> 2020 hi james hey guys hey ben hey ben thanks for having me oh yeah it's that a third... pleasure to have you oh yeah thanks i appreciate that man yeah that third album how's spring 2020 coming coming along now <laughs> yeah you have some time if it's not quite ready <laughs> yeah, you, you can have, you yeah. can sit on it you have all the time in the world mate. all the time oh, in the world. Man, no kidding. <laughs> are you still are you still working on it or is it kind of, is everything just at a halt right now yeah well actually everything's a bit at a halt we yeah. so we yeah it's kind of been a piecemeal um way of going about it it's it uh we were recording down at the beach studio through their app program taking advantage of studio time down there cool um so pro so as opportunities slotted in to record um we would take advantage of them so the material's all recorded and then um just kind of as part of growth you know we've had to look at our sound and where we want to take it, what what what's resonating with the audience and what isn't. Obviously, coming out of Calgary as a market is a difficult um, leap. So, so the material's kind of just being uh, revisited, rethought, and uh, and then we're kind of working at it from home piecemeal, You're talking it back and forth, and then eventually we'll have to take it to somebody um, to just work with us. Uh, mm -hmm if we finally make that leap as to who we want maybe want to actually uh, take the final route and re-envision the sound with us mm -hmm. for have you got any any people in mind to help you with that yeah for sure we worked with uh, steve durkins locally in town so st if you don't know steve uh, he runs a, a studio d in his place yeah. in britannia mm -hmm. he's amazing uh he worked he did the T tomorrowland album yeah I've, so I've, I've worked with steve before he's fantastic yeah, yeah, he's amazing, and I so I was down in his uh, studio one day. This was a while back now, mm -hmm. and he just said, "James, we'll do the album. Like, like, don't worry about the money. We'll do the album, but I need, uh, but I think we need to sit down and really restrip the sound. If you guys want to get to where you want to be, Tomorrowland was what it was. Um, so I never, so him and I sort of dropped off, and then we looked at other options. Um, but there, yeah, so it could be done really well locally here, and we know that. Mm -hmm. But I think um, we've just yeah, it's a journey. It's a process to figure out. So we've been working with a um, business manager in Vancouver mm -hmm. who really wanted to take us, and he's been doing surveys of the last album because we've got this um, odd thing that happens because of the nature of the music, a little bit nostalgic but a little bit um, modern as we try to describe it, is nobody, everybody, we get a response that everybody likes it but they don't know what it is. <laughs> So we're not fitting into the younger chain smokers, something like that sound. We're not we're we're resonating with audiences maybe a bit older than we yeah. than we intended. Yeah. Um, so how do we bridge that gap? What does that sound like? Is is actually a you know a worthwhile conversation? We got a, when when we listened to your music, we got a very much like a, a U two sort of vibe. You know, was that the sort yeah. of vibe you're you're you're, you're known for or you're going for? Or? Yeah, I'd say for the initial noticing of the music, yeah, that's usually what resonates. And that's okay with us. We get it all the time. In fact, that's just – so if people don't like us, that's pretty much their default uh, blow-off is, well, you sound too much like YouTube. So, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we keep making the case – it's just a, a band that's doing incredibly well of reinventing themselves all the time and staying – relatively consistent in an industry that's impossible i don't see how that's a bad thing either 100 um mm -hmm. but again our feedback comes from a relatively smaller market than we like so um the ra the reason that we sound like you two is because we're all of that group that grew up in the 80s so our storyline that we like to tell is a little bit more that we like to think we're a con that U2 delay sound that's not a wall of guitar sound yep. is more attractive as a sound to us. Mm -hmm. But because there's so few bands anymore that really resonate in that way, that's the default is they're just a U2 sound. But we would almost say like, you know, there's a uh, Simple Minds thing going on. There's a little bit of production that's a Depeche Mode thing. You don't hear it necessarily, but those were bands that we love. The Cure, right? Oh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So we so we just thought we'd reinvent that. And I would say, yeah, so Tomorrowland was maybe a little bit more of a like a you were back in a club in the 80s kind of sound without the synth mm-hmm. um, kind of thing. You know, 1985, 1986, 1987. Mm-hmm. That's when music was really resonating for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hoping that maybe it would cycle, that people would f- refine this kind of music that had, uh, you know, words that were worth listening to, messages that were of hope, and that, but that there was still kind of a rawness to it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Though I think it, music does like sort of regurgitate and like recycle itself. Like for instance, the band Greta Van Fleet are a perfect example of that. You know, it's just yeah. Led Zeppelin esque. You know, and people love it. Yeah, totally. And nobody says, well, they sound too much like Led Zeppelin. Yeah. That's what's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nobody goes, or maybe they did one time in their early career. Yeah. Uh, career, I'd love to know. I'd love to hear that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and our drummer gets likened to, um, yeah, to John Bonham all the time. John Bonham. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, what what happens if you put Pink Floyd, U two, and and I don't know if we can figure out the right sound and say, I mean, I I aspire to kind of a synth uh, digital production that I think Radiohead did a great job, right? Like Arcade um, Arcade Fire is doing a similar thing, but throwing a bunch of people. On as many people on stage in eclectic instruments as possible to create the same kind of dynamic that Radiohead can do. So, mm-hmm. you know, like what happens when that's questions we ask ourselves, like what, how do we aspire to be those bands mm-hmm. that lead it musically? We're not there yet, but we still ask ourselves those questions. Cause yeah, like what happens if you do have um, Bono in front of John Bonham and you've got, um, you know, like that's a Pete Town, I don't know, like that's a pretty good mix. And why can we not be those guys, right? Oh, no, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. Yeah. So what's uh, what's your writing process when you when when you write these albums and you write these songs? What's your writing process as a band? Do you like come up with that idea and then bring it to the band, or do or do you just write together as a band? Yeah, no, very older guys. It's hard to schedule everybody. So uh, the co writing the co writing happens between myself and uh, Storm, the guitarist, our guitarist, who's uh, also my brother. Oh, I know. Um, so, but as of more recently, yeah, a lot of it's been the process of me sitting, pondering, reflecting, and uh, watching too much. Well, I don't watch a lot of TV, but watching a lot of sort of politics and stuff out there and trying to create a response to it mm-hmm. um, that we feel collectively as a group uh, resonate. And and then um, Storm sort of is like the technician that really tries to find the sound with, within that. Yeah. So it is very, it is kind of a U two E kind of experience. We, I, we very rarely have written in the room together, which has been a, a bit of a downfall of I think um, uh, a, a time and energy, you know, uh, of where we live and how we exist. Everybody has kids and all that. Okay. So a lot of the, lead, so I'd say a lot of the lead comes from the words and the guitar that I that I'm working on here, the ideas I generate, and then I take them over for the guys to make sense of. And they build their pieces. And actually, a lot of the songs in the in the album were done in studio. So guys would come and just kind of respond to what they were hearing. So, wow. Dif- wow. yeah, and, yeah. And that was that was all done in in Studio D, yeah, with Steve. No, actually, these ones were done with yeah. No, these ones were done uh, down at the beach with with uh, the Academy for Performing Arts students through uh, Lanny Wilkinson, oh, wow. Williamson. Clemson, I want to get his name. That's a cool process to think of, though, if you have, you know, but that makes, I don't know, it just seems like it's a more natural process or a natural sound you'd get out of that just by having people respond to what you've created mm-hmm. and add on to that. I think that's really cool. Yeah, we've, we, sh- you know, we struggle with the perfection. I think that's, a, as a group, we struggle a little, I would say I'm projecting a little bit on the guys that could have different responses, but, um, like, I think we do, uh, music has become, so as you know, uh, film and video too, right? Our media. We for so much time we were trying to uh, create some sort of ultra perf- perfection, right? And I think um, even within that, to to compete in the big global market, it felt f- perfection becomes this thing to aspire to, so that people don't see your glitches and faults. But I think there's a much more humanistic approach when you when you pro- process it as artists would, like reacting to how you feel in that moment and then try that. Mm-hmm. So we do have, so the future, I'd say the new release, the future is definitely a, a, a bit of a departure for us on a technical standpoint because we are all reacting mm-hmm. to something. But I think what came, comes out of it, what I'm pleased with is it feels like 
it, it was intended to be the last song on the album. And what it feels like is literally four guys sitting in the room that don't know what the hell's going on, and somebody just starts something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And by and then by the end, you see the 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 magic of like that moment where they all lock in, and then you've got this great thing that just takes off, right? Yeah. And I feel that to me feels incredibly human. Mm-hmm. And love and lovely because that's a moment in time that that's that's been created mm-hmm. and captured and to me that's beautiful. Yeah, I've been involved in, in a few bands and we've the bands that I've been involved in have had lots of different like sort of writing processes and stuff. Like so, the, the first sort of big band I was in, our writing process was we'd spend twelve thirteen hours in our rehearsal room, and we'd just jam out and we'd record. You know every second of it and then we'd we'd all listen through and go okay that that's part is like quite a good idea okay let's work on that part and then that's how that's how it would sort of evolve and stuff you know and then we'd add on li- li- lyrics later and then once we'd added, added on lyrics we'd sort of change a few bits to sort of um to emphasize the lyrics more and stuff you know and yep. i've also been in bands where you know the sort of the, the main the main singer songwriter writes all the songs and then sends the rest of the musicians them and go okay do what you want you know you know so there's there's lots of different styles of um writing and recording you know absolutely yeah and i you know none of them are wrong or right i just uh for sure our methodology tended to become when it became time to prep for live shows and stuff and actually really perfect the songs even before going into studio was it's almost like theater go back and learn your parts we know what the song is well we've worked it out a little bit go come like work on your part and then we'll come together in that time where the four of us are together it is time to perfect and and hear the nuances and refine mm-hmm. as opposed to you know a, a much more efficient approach because yeah again a lot of it has to do with age um i don't want to sh- shouldn't keep talking about age because we're all young and hurt. But, um, you know, this idea that time, the time and energy of efficiency was to lock the band together as opposed to this writing and fighting and dynamic and who's right, who's wrong kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I, I think it um, has helped. Um, I think that approach helped us sort of get across a few finish lines in a more manageable way um, than when we were 18 and could sit all night jamming and going, that sounds really great. And not really doing anything more than just agreeing that it all sounds great. <laughs> if that was our, our, you know, our kind of high school band, uh, young experience. Mm-hmm. You're just so energized, right? You just want to get out there, and it sounds great. Any noise you can make is thrilling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, well, what is this? Like, what, what are we trying to say? What are we trying to do? For sure, for sure. Yeah. So, um, you said before we went live that you're you're a trained film director. Do you think yeah. being a trained film director has helped you um, in a band situation, being like a leader of the band and stuff like that? Probably not. <laughs> Probably made it worse. Probably made it worse. I think ego gets involved sometimes, and there's a false perception that I try to control things, which I, which, yeah. Um, no, but actually, maybe the opposite. I might even actually go the opposite. I think being a musician has really informed the way I work mm-hmm. as a f- filmmaker. Um, because music, because all media is story, right? Mm. Uh, and all, and there's a musical quality to and, and to pacing to how we deliver our stories. And I I feel like the music actually has helped me in the reverse. I uh, I wish I had had more opportunity to actually do music composition, or that's something. Or maybe I still have time to delve into later in life is to actually compose music for and score films. For film, yeah. The opportunity just hasn't come up, but I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be the more honest answer, I, but you know for sure some you know um, film directing is definitely about people management yeah. and time management. It's not about ra- railroading your vision through. Mm-hmm. It's about you know it's like any leadership. It's definitely about uh, being responsible to a bunch of. Film is so collaborative. I think music is too. That's kind of the beauty of it. When you get the right personalities, it's so collaborative that you're all working towards one vision. Um, so it's an honor to be kind of the person that lifts people up. Mm. Um, that's a film director experience. I, I would say I learned that the hard way, even like any young person, right? You feel like it's your, there gets to be a point where you feel like it's your vision and it's your way or the highway. Um, but that's not helpful. That's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So you learn. 
I was just going to yeah. say, you can really tell the, pe the, the directors. I've been on a, a couple of sets where you can tell where the director hasn't come from another background. They've gone right into film. Um, and it's, they're all about, this is my vision. This is what we're going to do. And it's just a different atmosphere than when you can tell if someone has come from collaborative theater or collaborative music or any other collaborative art form. It's a really different feeling on the set and it's much better. Yeah, for sure. My first lesson in, I was, like at school, I went to school and at Sheridan College in Oakville and, and our director of photography teacher, like we, you spend all this tuition and he <laughs> walks in day one and he's, uh, uh, Richard Leiterman is his name. He's he's a or since past but cinematographer of note in the Canadian scene. Mm -hmm. And he comes and so we're looking for this like how to do it properly kind of mentality. Like what are the technical skills? And he comes in the first day and says, "There's no wrong way to light a film." It's like, <laughs> well, what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah. But <laughs> but you know, but at the same time, what he was encouraging was it's art and that's mm -hmm. creativity. You, you know, again, this idea of striving for perfection. Is is something that puts you above. Um, it makes you feel like you're going to be successful and puts you above. But actually, there, it's all creation's cr wonderful, right? Mm. And all things are possible. It's just how passionate you are. And yeah, I've had been on some sets that are soul sucking too. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah. In my life, yeah. and I didn't want to be that. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, it sounds a little flippant, but I wanted to hang out with my friends and have fun. Mm. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. and have a good time. I bet you have some crazy stories of like film sets you've been been involved in, yeah. No, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not for today. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> you, you mentioned that you were the the or, or were I guess not anymore the president of the Calgary Independent Film Association. Yeah, Society of Independent Filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, if you don't know that, I'll do a big shout out to those guys. Whoever's watching, if you uh, actually, you know, because that is a thing. Calgary Society of Independent Filmmakers been around since 1978, founded by four guys who had some equipment and because of a contract they got um, to do tourism videos for the province, they wanted to keep the equipment. They didn't want to sell it off. Cool. What they thought was, well, why don't we keep the equipment and then just offer it to other people to create the opportunity for people to create in this town mm -hmm. at a at a cheap, reasonable level. So they mm -hmm. cooperated out this equipment. And so, yeah, 40 years later, it's still operating. And, you know, it's a good resource for independent film uh, makers. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved heavily that way. And one of the things I'd say back to the music thing is, yeah, that's a nice little piece to add is musicians and filmmakers and visual artists and stuff. We, we all know we're part of the same community, but it's hard to put those collaborations together sometimes. Mm -hmm. So knowing the, those organizations, if you're a musician listening and you have always wondered about like, yeah, how do we get into film scoring or, or who, how do I get my film or my music synced into something? Well, m building a relationship with a filmmaker is a great start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to know who they are, and you know, so places like that, uh, the film cooperative are, are places, are hubs of that kind of information, those kind of resources. You know, mm -hmm. we can we tend to compartmentalize ourselves quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I was um, I was told by one of my lecturers at university, if you wanted to get into film scoring and and uh, music for film. Is every film you watch when the end credits just write down the name of the music supervisor at the end, you know, and then look them up and yeah. contact them. Get in yeah. Yeah. Do you know what the best part of a movie is? What's the best part? It's the end, it's, the it's when everybody leaves and it's the end credits. <laughs> you learn so much. Yeah. I know exactly how a film. I know exactly how a film's financed. I know exactly who put the pieces together. I yeah, right. You know who the music supervisor is. Mm -hmm. You know how right. There is so much information that when you're going to build your projects. Or yeah, or get into these systems. It's all right there for you, mm -hmm. but we just see it as like the end of the story, and most people leave, right? I yeah, had, I had a professor who said once that he he never really sat and watched the credits at, in a movie because everyone gets up and leaves. And he said it's it's quite incredible, just you know, stay mm -hmm. and watch just the list of names that made this this project possible and the amount of departments yeah. that there were. So he said ever since then he sat and he's watched all the credits for every movie. That he that he sees, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. It's like, ooh, they did a co-production in in Hungary. They shot three days in Hungary and yeah. had to hire a whole group of people in in that country. And they shot on Kodak. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, there's clearly at least eighty percent of this film is digital because there's at least twenty minutes of, uh, you know, compositors and visual effects artists yeah. like names scrolling by. Like, you know, it's an actual blue. Like, it really is. Yeah. 
I don't know what, where we're going with this, but yeah, it's valuable for sure. Where we're going so, is it's cool. Yes. <laughs> watch the end. Yeah, if watch the credits. Watch the credits, yeah. yeah. Read um, the liner of the, you know, in digital with music. Like, we don't look at CDs anymore. We don't see the packaging of art the same way. I, I like, you know, I'm. it's nice to see vinyl come back just for some of that, too. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we think in musically, I'll go back to there, like, who do I get involved to do our cover art? Mm-hmm. You know, what's does the packaging look like? What's the storyline in the thanks? What, how did they? How did these people get there? We don't tend to see that anymore. It's all sort of um, in the metadata that we don't look at it. Mm-hmm. We're just sort of taking surface level examinations of the art. I like it. I don't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Very sometimes it's a little soul sucking or dissatisfying, mm-hmm. especially when you've poured your heart and soul into it. You guys are both musicians, right? So I'm actually not. You, Oh, you're not he's a, no. he's a magician. Magician. Oh, you're a magician. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, oh, I can't play yeah. an instrument to save my life. <laughs> What's your best trick? Oh, geez, my best trick. Um, it fluctuates. I think I have a couple different yeah? shows that I can offer people. I do mostly corporate entertainment, and then in the summer oh, yeah. festivals. So it depends on the show. My favorite yeah, trick would enough. be cups and balls. Cups and balls. Yeah. Yeah. Balls. It's a he classic. Likes, he likes balls. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I wasn't gonna say it. That's amazing. I want to see. I want to see that. Yeah, see, that's sure. magical. Yeah. That that and uh, uh, stand up comedy. That like. Well, it's a comedy show as well. Hard to do. Yeah, I do. I do comedy and do, magic. Yeah. 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 See, yeah. like Matt, like serious <laughs> shout out to to you. That's not easy. It, that's no. that's all vulnerability. I like you, James. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I. <laughs> somebody once said to me that they, I should do. Uh, I don't think I'm that funny, but I think I'm comical enough or jovial enough. But to the sheer thought of a spotlight, a microphone, and what I think, and a bunch of people who whose literal job is to hate me, mm-hmm. or or I have to win over. Yep. I've sort of like that. I guess it goes kind of to the solo performing <laughs> musically. I've started to do now. Like it's, it's. There's a particular rush and, and uh, energy that comes from it, but I would say it's always been really nice to have three other people up there with me. Mm-hmm. Well, me I, f- like- <laughs> I find that I have the props because I don't think I could do just comedy. So I have all of these other things I can fall back on in, in the tricks. Right. So right. I have the same same thing. They're just not people. They're cards. <laughs> yeah 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 Fair, yeah exactly right. yeah. so yeah just something right? something anything <laughs> anything i can throw at you really <laughs> <laughs> i like it yeah i like it uh just before we wrap up i know it, you um you we asked people for a little package and in your little info package you, you mentioned that you're doing apartment concerts now yeah um how, how are those going and the, like what 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 can people expect if they hire you well or how, how, i guess how do you go about doing it at all you know what i'm just so it would been been on my mind for a while i've been in this apartment um down in bridgeland uh here for a long time um i i've stayed here way longer than i ever meant to so it's part of like uh but one of the things that as i was watching you know again uh bigger uh things out there you know there'd be these quirky things fallon's doing something mm-hmm. fun everybody's doing something fun and i'm and one of the things I thought is, yeah, we were having trouble getting the kind of more meaningful uh, sh- shows we wanted in Calgary. We felt like it was drying up. So th- there was a lot of songs and material I was building up that I was just playing to myself in this apartment, mm-hmm. maybe taking out to gr- to a couple of uh, places. So I thought, well, what if uh, my apartment just became a yeah a tiny apartment concert place? And so the initial idea was I'd bring bands in. We'd do like an NPR desktop concert right. from here, from Calgary. Mm-hmm. So you guys like doing this is awesome. I, I think it's terrific. Um, so, but now with the, obviously the uh, coronavirus, uh, people can't come to my place. Yeah. So I just, <laughs> so I had started shooting, filming them, and um, I, putting them out Friday nights. And I ended up doing that very first Friday where nobody knew if they were going back to work on Monday. I ha- I was ready to go with my first episode. So it was me just playing three or four songs, and yeah, it resonated out really well on Facebook. You know, um, Friday night, people were uncertain and, and uh, you know, all of a sudden they were on, online looking for support. So it resonated really well. So now I'm trying to get them out every Friday. I don't want to be like Facebook's become a wonderful sort of busker alley. People are yeah. doing all sorts of amazing, cool things. Oh, yeah. You can kind of weave in and out of creativity 
which is awesome, lovely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so what they can expect is it's pre, it's it's live streamed Friday. Mm -hmm. I do pre-record them because I can, because mm -hmm. what I'm really enjoying doing is I can make the music the way I want it. It's yeah. not just me, singer songwriting. I'm trying to revision these songs. So that's actually kind of a nice thing to do during the week is I'll record tonight. And then I'll pl like I'll do the other instrumentation after I record. Mm -hmm. So it's just a small snippet of four or five songs. I'm not taking up your whole night. I, I don't want anything from anybody. Um, I just want to be part of like the reminder to everybody that it's going to be okay. We're going to come out on the other side of this. And uh, in the meantime, hey, why don't you come stop by and listen to me entertain you since you can't. And then, you know, the idea being if this uh, goes well and, and things open up, then maybe this can become a, a spot for a very similar series to what you guys are doing. I think the more the merrier right now. Yeah, yeah. that's People awesome. Really, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so Friday I try to go out at 6.30, uh, just around supper time, not too late, uh, sometimes 7 o'clock on my Facebook stream. Wicked. They can check it out. Or on YouTube at Tiny Apartment, yeah, Rex Siedler Films, Tiny Apartment Concerts. Awesome. Fantastic, fantastic. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much for being on. Really do appreciate it. It's, it's been fantastic talking to you. Yeah, you guys too. Really appreciate it. I went by really quickly, so that's a good sign. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. yeah. You guys be well and keep doing your series. I'm really impressed with it. And uh, thank yeah, you so much. thanks very much. Really yeah, yeah, appreciate yeah, that. It's, you bet. So, where where can people find um, Rayo on social media? Yeah, it's uh, Rayo Music. So Rayo is uh, is a Finnish name, so it's spelt a little bit different. Uh, R E I J O. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rayo is the J is silent. So Rayo Music, uh, Instagram, Rayo Music, Twitter. We're we're not on Ray Twitter a lot. I don't love Twitter, but Rayo I'm Music. Either. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just a noise. It's just yeah, noise. Yeah. Noise. Um, Facebook dot com Rayo. Mm -hmm. Bandcamp as well. Music. Bandcamp, rayo.bandcamp.com. Yeah, and the new single, The Future, we got to uh, put out a nice video, really pleased with it, with uh, some NASA satellite footage of the Earth. So we thought it was a great time to release this track, The Future. Check it out. Uh, ray yeah, rayo.bandcamp.com, or the video is on YouTube at, uh, at Rayo Music. Wicked. Well, Fantastic. thanks so much, James. Awesome, guys. We'll see you soon. Yeah, Take have care. a great day. Bye-bye. Oh. Yeah, you too. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Calgary Basement Sessions. If you like the content, don't forget to like and subscribe. That really helps us out. And please follow us on social media on Facebook and Instagram at YYC Basement Sessions.